So we're going to talk about animals, and in particular, today's topic is invertebrates. So organisms that don't, that are animals uh, that don't have a backbone. Okay, I mean that's a big, broad group of things, right? Um, it's technically not a class part of our classification scheme, but um, that's essentially where we're at. But first, we're going to start with just a general definition of an animal. So animals are uh, heterotrophic, eukaryotic, multicellular creatures. Okay, let's break that down. Um, you know all those words. It's been a while maybe since you heard them. Heterotrophs just eat other things. So they can't make their own food like plants can with the sunlight. Obvious, like animals are heterotrophs. Eukaryotic means that they have complex cells with membrane-bound organelles like a nucleus, right? Mitochondria, um, other things along those lines. Um, so uh, they're more advanced in many ways than bacteria or, or uh, archaebacteria. Multicellular, all animals have more than one cell. Uh, there are single-celled animal-like things. We call them protists. We also have flex flexible cell membranes. We don't have a cell wall like fungi and plants have a cell wall okay, uh, outside of their uh, membrane. We don't have that. So we don't have a rigid structure like that. We have flexibility and our cells are, are more flexible. Now, most animals also are motile, reproduce sexually, and will respond to a stimulus. Uh, now, the reason I say most is because there's some weird things like, you know, like sponges that don't really move, per se. Uh, however, they do have cells that move inside of them. So they, they have movement, and many animals that we wouldn't think of as moving also have movement at some point during their life cycle. So movement is kind of a characteristic, sort of, of most animals. Sexual reproduction is a big animal thing, uh, but there are some animals that also reproduce asexually. Uh, responding to external stimuli. So if you poke an animal, something's going to happen. It's going to respond, right? Um, if you poke a cheetah, you're going to probably lose an arm. Right? So something's going to happen. Now, if you poke a sponge, you're probably not going to see a whole lot happen. right? So uh, that's why I said most animals are going to do these things. Okay, everybody got it? I'll give you a second if you're jotting stuff down. All right, we need to kind of define a few words we're going to use. You're going to hear these throughout the unit. In particular, when we do our pig dissections, you're going to hear these four words. They are anterior, dorsal, posterior, and ventral. And all they do is refer to parts of an organism. So the anterior end, the A end, is the head end. Easy enough to remember. The posterior, okay, or the rear end, is the back end of the organism, okay? Dorsal is the, the, the back side, okay? So uh, you can remember that with the dorsal fin of a shark. That's that fin that's along its back. And ventral is the belly side. So for instance, if you pet a cat on the ventral side, chances are after the third or fourth pet, you're going to have your arm mauled, right? So ventral is the bottom, the belly there. Posterior is the butt end. Anterior is the head end, and dorsal is the back side. Pretty easy to remember. Uh, you don't necessarily have to write those down if you can just kind of remember them. Next is symmetry. So we're going to refer to three types of symmetry in terms of different organisms. Uh, the first one is bilateral symmetry. If you cut this beetle in half, you can fold one side over the other, and they're identical. So that's what bilateral symmetry is. If we look at a, a, a coral polyp or a jellyfish or a starfish, they have what's called radial symmetry. They radiate out from the center. So think of it like spokes on a wheel. That's what radial symmetry means. And finally, a sponge is asymmetrical, or what we refer to as no symmetry, because no matter how you cut it, one side doesn't necessarily match the other side. They just kind of grow all haphazard-like. Now, symmetry is an interesting thing because the bilaterally symmetric group of organisms tend to have a unique feature known as cephalization. We'll, we'll come to that here in a second. Um, but 
can you tell just looking at this which of these creatures actually has a head end and a rear end? It's obvious, isn't it? It's the beetle. Yeah, so there's something special about that because that's also what you have. What kind of symmetry do humans have? If we were to cut ourselves, how could we cut ourselves? Right down the middle, right? And you could fold it together like a paper person and we'd be bilaterally symmetric. So bilaterally symmetric creatures tend to display this thing called cephalization. And it's a unique feature. You don't have to write all this down. I just want you to understand what it is. Uh, it's the, the movement or the migration of like sensory organs towards the, the head end, towards the anterior end of the creature, okay? And, and that allows things like a large brain to form. That allows things like eyes to form, like nostrils and olfactory sensory things. So all the sensory stuff is up in one end. Did you ever consider that? Not all creatures are like that. A sponge doesn't have that. So, and of course there's degrees of this. And I, I've kind of put a different, some different creatures up here. We've got like a sea anemone and a sea star. Um, they're, they're both radially symmetric and they don't really have cephalization at all. When we get into the flatworms though, flatworms do have some cephalization, don't they? They definitely have a head end. They've got eye spots up there. Um, there's more neurons and the neurons are arranged more up there towards the head end. We get down into the squid and you have the same thing. Really well de developed cephalization, definite brain region, huge eyes, right? All sorts of sensory organs up front. Uh, even the earthworm has some cephalization. It's got a brain up there in one end. You, know, you don't think of worms as being very smart, but they do have a little brain in there. Uh, in humans, of course, we have, we're extremely cephalized. It's, it's, this is a very distinctive thing that bilaterals have. All right, one more before we dive into the different phyla of animals that are invertebrates. So there's three types of what we call coelomation. There are acelomate creatures, pseudocelomate, and coelomate creatures. And all this refers to is your development from the blastula. So when the sperm and the egg get together, the, the, that single-celled thing starts to grow and divide. And as it grows and divides, in some creatures, it makes various regions of it inside of itself. And in fact, in us, it ends up giving us not only a hollow tube that goes from one end and out the other, but a hollow cavity inside where organs can be. So like, if you think about that, like inside your, inside your abdomen, like it's, it's, it's hollow in there. I don't know if you've ever seen any videos of a person being cut open or, or a uh, deer being cut open or something like that, but it's a big open cavity inside. You open it up and all the organs just fall out. That has to do with the way that we develop. So if we take it from acelomate creatures, things like flatworms, they don't have a body cavity at all. All of their organs, if they have any at all, are stuck within the, the thick tissues that are in their body. And you can see that picture there. Yeah, they can have a digestive cavity. They can even have a tube that goes from one end and out the other. But if they've got any complexity, it's just embedded right there um, in that mesoderm material inside of them. Then there's the pseudocelomates, which are, means false coelom. So these things sort of kind of have a coelom. And what it is, it's a, it's a rigid sort of fluid-filled cavity that's partly lined with the mesoderm cells. And in roundworms, they use, those, they use the muscles in it to, to brace against it for better movement. This is kind of how they move. And then finally, creatures like us um, and earthworms, segmented worms have this as well, fish, insects, a lot of what you would consider the higher level animals, the more complex animals, we have specialized organs. Think about like your liver, your gallbladder, right? Your stomach, all these things that are inside of you, your heart, they have these, we have this cavity that all those organs sit in and they develop very specialized inside of us. So that's all that is. So coelomate creatures are like mollusks, um, the annelid, the segmented worms, arthropods, 
echinoderms, of course, chordates, which we're not going to cover today. Everybody good? So this is phylum periphera, and we're going to go through all the different phyla of invertebrate animals. So remember our breakdown, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's a lot. We can't possibly learn all the species and genera that are on our planet, right? But we can learn all the different phyla of animals, because there's not that many. Now, some of the phyla we're going to talk about are, we're going to go into some classes a little bit. So we'll break it down just a little bit further for some of the important ones. But this first one is the simplest of all. Remember we said sponges are probably very similar to some of the very first animals that ever lived on our planet. Sponges are crazy simple creatures. In fact, you can take a sponge and squeeze it through a sieve and all the cells that come out of it, like break it down into individual cells, they'll reorganize themselves back into a creature. It will look different than the original sponge, but they'll grow themselves back into a sponge. All the cells will get together and do it all over again. It's really interesting. So uh, sponges are a great example of that, but if you look inside, there's actually much more going on than you might think. Okay? There's some different types of cells in there. So they have a simple body plan. They're asymmetrical, which means when you cut them, one side's not going to match the other. Uh, they're filter feeders, and the way that works is they have these little pore cells um, and little pores on the outsides of their body there, and water is pulled in those pores, and then it flows up the tube and out the top, which is called the osculum. And as it goes through those pores, they filter out some things in the water and eat it. So they eat what's, what they're filtering. Uh, they do reproduce sexually, and, and some of them asexually as well. You, if a piece is broken off, it'll grow a new one. Uh, but they do, they do reproduce sexually. There's some different cell types, which is interesting. Let's look at a couple of the different cell types. Now, they don't have tissues like we have muscle tissue and skin tissue and neural tissue, um, but they do have some different cells. Inside of there, there's what's called collar cells, and the collar cells have a little whip-like fl flagella, a little tail on it. So just like mammal sperm do, these little things, rather than swim, they, they, they're attached to the rest of the cells, and they whip that tail, and it moves the water through the pores and up and out the osculum. And so that's how the water flows. They don't just sit there and wait. They pump the water through themselves. Uh, let's see, what else do they have here? We have amoeboid cells, which are really interesting, sometimes referred to as amoebocytes. And these cells are in the skeleton of the sponge itself, and they can move through it. So remember when we said, like, sponges don't move? Well, some of their cells move quite a bit. So it's, it's kind of a weird sort of a thing, right? Um, they do have a skeleton that's made up of this usually soft spongin, um, and then they have some harder parts called spicules inside. And that's what makes up the actual, the thing you would call a sponge if you picked up a dried dead one at the beach or bought one from the store. Okay, that's just their skeleton. The living creature's not in there anymore. Uh, and I think we went over all the rest of those. Okay, everybody have it? Cool. Next up is phylum cnidaria. And the cnidarians are distinctive because they have these stinging cells. Um, cnidarians also have radial symmetry, which I don't think I wrote up there, but we mentioned before. So they, they, they look like spokes on a wheel. Uh, these things are things like jellyfish and corals are the two main cnidarians you might think of. They're so named because they have these distinctive cells called cnidocytes. Get it? The C is silent, so just pronounce it with an N. A cnidocyte, which I put a picture of over here, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a cell, and coiled up down inside of it is a little harpoon. And there's a trigger hair on one end. And when you brush that trigger hair, um, those cells eject that basically harpoon, and it jabs into you and stings you. And that's how they catch their prey. Whether they're catching fish or whatever they're hunting, that's how they get it. Now, sometimes it happens to us if you're out swimming in the ocean, and a jellyfish brushes against you, uh, you might experience uh, these little trigger, trigger hair cells that shoot those harpoons into you and sting you. It hurts really bad. Okay. Um, other things about cnidarians, they actually have two very unique body plans. It's called a polyp and a medusa. So uh, oftentimes, the thing called the polyp um, 
will anchor itself and be stuck to the ground someplace, stuck to a reef or something like that. But the medusa will swim around. So some of these things, a lot of them have two parts to their cycle. So they'll be like a medusa for part of their life, and for part of their life, they'll be a polyp. It's kind of a unique way of living, right? Having two totally different like parts of your life cycle like that. Okay, the next up are the worms, and there's a lot of worm phyla. There's three different worm phyla. Their worms are so diverse on our planet, that, and they're different enough that we have three different large groupings for worms. The first one is nematoda, which is the round worms. Yep, they are round. Okay. Remember the other types of worms we did? We did round worms, flat worms, and segmented worms. Segmented worms can be round or flat looking, but they've got segments on them. These things are round without any segments. So we're looking in here. A lot of these are parasites. Those might be some um, worms inside of a dog or something like that. That's pretty gross, isn't it? So these things tend to gross us out because they're disgusting parasites. Uh, what do we have with the, with the nematodes? Well, they have a false body cavity. They're a pseudocoelomate. They have open, open circulatory systems. So we're going to talk about circulatory systems. That's how your blood pumps around inside your body. And an open circulatory system does not move the blood around inside the body. It just has to diffuse around and get to the parts. So creatures that, are, that don't have a fully developed circulatory system can't tend to get very large because they don't have a way to pump the blood around. Their skeletons, they don't have bones or anything like that or hard shells. They have water skeletons. It's called hydrostatic skeleton. So the water pressure inside of them holds them in shape. And the, they're bilaterally symmetric. You could cut them one way, and they would fold in half. Those are, those are roundworms. Make up a significant portion of the soil, actually. Like pound for pound, they're the most populous organism in the soil. Next up are the flatworms, and yep, they're worms that are flat. This is the one you guys saw down in lad called the planaria, and the planaria actually has quite a bit of cephalization. Look at the two eye spots up at the top of the head here. It's got a head. Uh, the eyes, it, they don't move around. I know they look like googly eyes, but really all they can sense is like dark and light. They can tell if it's darker or lighter where they're going. It helps them to feed. So they have they have some well-developed ganglia here, so they have a nerve, nervous system. Uh, they've got one long intestine here that kind of branches out near the sides of them. And they have a really interesting sort of feeding mechanism. Their mouth comes out of their belly, right out of the ventral side. So it would kind of be like me having a long tube out my belly button that reached around and could move on its own and like eat stuff. It's real weird. Now to excrete waste, since they have an opening down there like on their ventral belly, they don't have an opening near their head. There's no mouth up there. So to get rid of their waste, what they do is they have these specialized flame cells that are kind of on the outer edges of its body, and they excrete waste out the sides of the planaria. Okay. Uh, yep, they're bilaterally symmetric. They don't have a body cavity, so uh, anything in them just has to be embedded in what they have there. Um, they do have some more specialized organs. No, no respiratory or circulatory systems. Once again, they're not, they're not pumping blood around in there. There's not a heart or anything like that. Tapeworms are another example. Ooh, another parasite. A lot of these worms are parasites, aren't they? Next up, everybody's favorite phylum, the annelids. Annelida is the segmented worms, and you are most familiar with an earthworm and a leech. Has anybody ever had a leech on them before? Yeah, I've had lots of leeches on me. When you, when you pulled it off, they're messy eaters, like blood's usually dripping out of your leg or wherever, and you're like, ooh, what is that? But they pull right off. They're not a big deal. They like, suction onto you, and they have this little row of teeth, and they scratch your skin a little bit and then drink what comes out. 
Um, a lot of people are allergic to them. I am. I get itchy spots when I get leeches on me. But if you pulled them off and looked at them carefully before you freaked out and threw them down on the ground and stomped on them, you'd notice they have little ridges, little segments. So even though they look pretty flat when they're on you, they're not balled up like the one is in the picture, they do have these little ridges on them. You can see that green one there the, on the, on the uh, ventral side, on the belly side there. It's got the orange. Uh, earthworms also have those ridges, so they're segmented as well. And they're quite complex. Like if you look inside of an earthworm, there's a whole series of hearts in there. There's, there's a whole circular, it's a closed circulatory system, but look at that. It's a, it's a whole closed circulatory system, so it's pumping blood around to its different organs. And look at the complexity inside of an earthworm. Way more complex than we've looked at so far. So not only do they have closed circulatory systems where they pump blood around, but they're also coelomate. So they have a body cavity, a true body cavity, which means they can have more complex organs. And they, of course, they do. Uh, they've got a crop, a gizzard, an esophagus, intestines, their hearts, um, mouth, a little brain, all these parts. Basically, dirt goes in one end and poop comes out the other. It's a big tube for processing dirt for the most part. They eat decomposing stuff in the soil. Uh, now, earthworms and a lot of these worms have these specialized hairs called setae. And if you've ever tried to pull an earthworm out of the ground, ever notice that like you can't and it rips in half? It's not only because they're, they're flexing their muscles and, and holding themselves in, but they have little hairs that point the other direction. So when you try and pull them, those hairs grip the ground and won't come out. So if you're holding an earthworm in your hand to go fishing with it, you can slide your fingers one direction down and it's pretty smooth. But if you go the other direction, it's not smooth. Those are the tiny little hairs that I'm talking about there. And it helps them to move into sense vibrations in the soil and things like that. Um, they have specialized excretory organs. They've got a hydrostatic skeleton and segmentation. There we have it. Good. Okay. Next up is a big group. This is phylum mollusca. And I put three different classes of mollusks up here because they're so different. Okay, so they're, they're similar enough that they're all in the same phylum, but they're different enough that we break them down further into different classes. So the first group are the gastropods, and that essentially translates to stomach foot. So their foot is their stomach. And think about what a snail looks like. These are the snails and the slugs. Slugs don't have a shell, snails have one shell. They actually make it with a special organ um, that we'll talk about here in a second called a mantle. Now, they also have something known as a radula, which is this rasping tongue that can scrape algae off the sides of your aquarium. It, it's very rough if you've ever felt a radula. Uh, they have specialized gas exchange. Some do it with their skin. Some have gills. Some have little rudimentary lungs. Um, a very diverse way of getting oxygen. There we go. So next up here are the bivalves. They have two shells. Get it? Bivalve. Two valves. So think of like a clam, a mussel, an oyster, a scallop. Those are, those are all bivalves with the two shells. They filter feed. That's the way they get their food. And then finally, my favorite, the cephalopods. Cephalopods are just so cool. Cephalopods are some of the most intelligent animals aside from us on the planet. It's a pretty neat group. Cephalopod essentially means like brain foot. These things have tentacles coming out of their head. That's what they are. So anything that's like that, think of the cuttlefish, this picture down here. It's got these tentacles coming out of its head, these big eyes. Super smart. The nautilus, called nautilus there, look at that big eye. The octopus, the squid, those are all cephalopods. Okay. Uh, they have closed circulatory systems, tentacles. Again, really complex creatures. Everybody got it? All right, let's look in particular, just so you can see some of these features, at a gastropod. So here's a snail. Have you ever found snail shells that look like this, like down in the river? We have them around here. They're big. Um, if you've noticed this hard thing right on the inside of the shell, uh, the snail is in there. It's just covered itself up. It's closed off its opening with what's called an operculum. And when it sticks its foot back out, the operculum's kind of attached to the back of the foot back there. 
So basically, all it has to do is suck itself back up inside of its shell, and that operculum is like a flap that just covers it off. Um, so like I said, they've got a foot, and that's how they crawl around. Uh, they have a radula, a rasping tongue inside there. And their mantle, is, their mantle is an organ that makes this shell. So if that seems strange to you, it's really not that strange. You, you do biomineralization as well. You make bones with chemicals in your environment. All the snail does is take chemicals out of the water that it's in and build a, a hardened structure over top of itself. It excretes this. So it's really not that strange of a thing. We just do it on our insides. Now, bones and shells are made out of some different, slightly different stuff, but the, the concept's pretty much the same. Okay. All right, next up are the echinoderms. So hopefully that word echinoderm kind of sounds pointy and spiny to you because these things are essentially the spiny skinned critters. So echinoderm basically means spiny skin. And they have a radial symmetry. Some examples would be a starfish, what we call a sea star, a sand dollar, a sea biscuit, sea urchin, sea cucumber, sea everything. There's some pictures of them over there. See how they have a radial symmetry? They kind of fan out in this star-shaped pattern. The sea cucumber has that same pattern there if you stood it on end and looked down the end of it. Okay. So uh, crinoids are in here as well. I don't have them up there. But they've got a water vascular system, which is a really unique thing. So in order to move, what they do is they suck in water from their surroundings, and they pump it into these little sacs called ampullae, like in the case of the starfish, and it will squeeze those sacs to push these tube feet out and move itself along. It is the coolest thing. It's really neat to hold the starfish because you can feel the little tube feet moving around on you. Super cool. Uh, their skeleton is made up of these little, little hard little platelets that we call ossicles. They've got a madreporite, which you can see on the starfish there. It's a little faint white spot kind of up between the top two arms there. Um, and what that is is a little water filter plate and it pulls water into that little, it looks like a wart, and filters it into the water vascular system in order to move its legs around, move its little tube feet. Like I said, spiny skin, radial symmetry, and many of these can regenerate. If you cut an arm off of a starfish, it will grow back, grow a new one back. I think there's a few starfish that if you cut them pretty close to down the middle, they'll grow too. I think there might be a couple that can do that. Some of them are really good at it. Most animals that can do regeneration are very, very simple. They're not complex. For instance, most, most animals that have some degree of cephalization, in other words, like sensory organs in one end, they can't regenerate from any part at all. If a part gets cut off, it can't grow back. Yep. Everybody got it? The next group we're going to talk about, the last group, is the most dominant animals on Earth. They're very, very numerous. They are everywhere. And they are called the arthropods. Ready? The arthropods, they have some very distinctive characteristics. And we're going to list a couple of their classes because they are so numerous and they're unique. First off, they have exoskeletons. If you stomp on one, it goes crunchy crunch. They have, their skeleton is external to their body. So not quite like a shell, but it's hardened on the outside surface. And it's made of a material known as chitin. Now, they also have to molt that. They have to shed it in order to grow bigger. Like a grasshopper can't just get bigger. These things have to shed. The, Picture of the scorpion up there. It has to shed its outer, outer dermis in order to get larger. Uh, they do gas exchange through a lot of different methods. Some have gills, uh, some have trachea, some have book lungs. Uh, they've got a lot of complex ways of getting oxygen. Uh, segmentation, that is a defining characteristic. They've got jointed legs and segmented bodies. So look at the jointed legs on that scorpion. 
Hey, look at all the segments in its body. See the pill bug down there? Look at all the segments in the pill bug. Segmented bodies and jointed legs. They have open circulatory systems, so they're, they're not complex as, say, a human or something like that, or even an earthworm. Uh, they have compound eyes, which is unique. Look at all the facets on those eyes of that fly there. And I put down one, two, three, four, five different classes, and let's go through them here. The insects have six legs. That would be things like beetles, grasshoppers, butterflies. The arachnids, uh, as you know, have eight legs and would probably think of spiders, but that also includes weird things like scorpions, ticks, and mites. Those are all grouped together with spiders. That's their class, is, is arachnida. The crustaceans, the crusty things that live on the bottom of the ocean, right? These th are things like crabs and lobsters. They have gills. Uh, the pill bug is actually a crustacean. Did you know that? Pill bugs have little gills in there, and if you find them in your garage, they have dried up and are they're dead, right? Because they, what happened was they, they got away from water for too long. They have to live underneath logs and things like that in order to keep themselves damp enough to, to do gas exchange. And then finally, we have the chilopodes and the diplopodes. So chilopoda is the centipedes, and diplopoda is the millipedes. Now, what makes them really different? If you look close, centipedes will just have one leg on each side per segment coming off both directions. Millipedes will have two per segment coming off. Now the reason you might actually care is because centipedes are poisonous and in, in, in bite with poison, and millipedes are just friendly and eat decaying stuff on the ground. Centipedes hunt. We have huge millipedes around here, like as big around as your pinky, like a couple inches long. Really cool looking. Okay, any questions guys? That's it for the invertebrate group of animals. Next time we'll, we'll go through chordates.